Welcome back from Hamburg. It's 14 hours local time in Germany and we've got lots of good stuff coming up this afternoon for you. So please stay with us for the rest of today's know-how on renewable energies and top of the notch wind business insights. Coming up in the next hour, the first round of our exhibited talks and later this afternoon we're giving you some more high quality insights on the markets in Asia. So let's now jumpstart and listen to Paul Skiabek. He's the Chief Innovation and Product Officer for the Service Business Unit of Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. His topic this afternoon is the role of hydrogen for the future of renewable energy. Hydrogen is, uh, I think, the world's most common energy carrier when it comes to uh, the fuels we know today. Uh, hydrogen is in, in more or less all fuels like diesel and uh, gasoline, uh, coal, etc. So it's, it's a very, very commonly used energy carrier. The problem with the current use of it is that it's all, almost always connected to carbon, which whenever it's burned, that uh, the carbon kind of gets detached from the hydrogen and turns into CO2 and goes into the atmosphere. Hydrogen is the substance in the fuels we know of today. We just need to put it in now into a form where we do not get the CO2 emissions. And hydrogen is an absolutely key component in solving the environmental problems we have on these hard to abate sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it, the hydrogen itself is not the magic thing. It's how you manufacture the hydrogen. Because we have tons of hydrogen we could get from natural gas, but we need to manufacture it in a way that we do not get the CO2. Uh, many, many use cases for hydrogen uh, even from, from food industry to uh, enrichment in refineries to steel industries uh, to, to uh, fertilizer manufacture, all of them uses hydrogen. The problem is that the hydrogen is used today is for like 99% of the, of the volume created by uh, uh, turning natural gas into hydrogen. And when you do that process, you get all this uh, CO2 that we do not want. So you basically take uh, the natural gas, which is uh, one carbon uh, molecule and four hydrogen, and you split it. And then you take the hydrogen and you leave the carbon together with oxygen from the air, and then you have hydrogen and CO2. So that's not a very nice way to produce it. it that, that's, the, that's the very beauty of hydrogen, because when you do it from uh, renewable energy, uh, you fundamentally take the electricity and you use the electricity to split water into its basic materials, which is uh, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, that's why it's called H2O. You get two hydrogen uh, uh, particles and one uh, oxygen. And uh, what happens uh, when you reverse it and you actually burn the hydrogen, it actually goes back to, to water. So, so it, it's a closed circle where you take water, you use energy to split it, and then when you use it to create uh, energy somewhere, then you actually go back to water and you can do the process again. Completely circular way of, of running the use of water, so to speak. So the world is running on water with green hydrogen. <laughs> what has made hydrogen become a, an attractive thing to produce from renewable energy is really the fact that we have had a huge success in bringing down the cost of renewable energy. Because the driver behind the, you say, the price of hydrogen is really the cost of the electricity. And given the fact that we have managed to reduce that significantly over the last decades, that is what once of a sudden makes it very interesting because we can now produce hydrogen at prices which are still not matching the ones from natural gas, but it's getting much, much closer. And you see the gap now is, is not that big anymore. So it starts to get interesting to produce a green hydrogen. Yeah, I still think we will see, uh, you see all kind of combinations in the future. There will be uh, places where, I mean, electricity is the need you have, so that's what you will produce. I also see uh, huge opportunities for kind of coupling the various sectors because you can somehow use the hydrogen production to balance, you know, when there are no uh, need for the electricity, uh, especially in the countries like Denmark and other places where you have high penetration already of wind. You see on Sunday mornings, all the turbines are stopped. It's not because they are broke, it's because they cannot get rid of the power. And obviously in such cases, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense that you will produce hydrogen instead, so you will have kind of hybrid facilities. Uh, that being said, I still think in the longer run, if we really want to replace all fossil fuels, we will see massive amount of facilities dedicated for producing hydrogen and any de derived products like methanol, um, ammonia, etc. Mm -hmm. from that, because the amounts that will be needed if you want to replace coal and oil and gas will be so enormous that uh, it, it would not make any sense to try and push that 
energy through the public electricity grids, we need to turn it into ammonia or whatever uh, as fast as possible. There are definitely places where it would make sense already tomorrow to start thinking about producing hydrogen rather, especially for wind farms where uh, you say the remuneration for the electricity produced are very low. There are uh, old wind farms where that used to get subsidies with around other subsidies. It would be a very smart move to actually maybe turning them into producing hydrogen uh, for, for some years. Uh, so yes, there is definitely quite some, uh, some potential already that could be implemented in the next few years. Especially in Northern Europe, you see quite uh, some political movement. We already see uh, turning parts of the renewable that are being built into hydrogen is, is a part, you say, of winning uh, a project, of getting the, the rights to build it. So, so that is a, a clear driver. We also see, for example, uh, countries like in South America, you most likely can produce the, the cheapest electricity for the, for the hydrogen production, especially if you combine wind and solar. So, so there are, say, cost drivers that would make that maybe a, a, a place where things would be scaled up faster. We see also in uh, in uh, in Asia political uh, initiatives that drives the development. If you look at Japan, etc., they are quite advanced. They're already talking about a hydrogen economy and an economy. So, so because they have already the challenges of shutting down the nuclear power plants, and they need to find something different very, very quickly. So, so uh, I would definitely say Northern Europe, uh, South America, Australia, maybe also, and, and, and the rest of Asia. I think that is where we we'll see things happen. So you see, everybody wants to kind of get into the race now. So that is a very, very positive thing here. Uh, I think what, what the trick is now is really to get the first, you say, real projects going of a certain scale. We have now done our, or are about to finish our demonstrator. We, we need to see the, the bold and, and courageous uh, also investors that will kind of take the first projects forward now, because that, that's really what we need now. We need to get commercial scale on the first projects. So this project is really to demonstrate that we can uh, run a, a wind turbine, a wind turbine park together with an electrolyzer and actually create uh, green hydrogen without having to transfer to the public grids. So it's fundamentally the pilot of uh, you say a future uh, renewable generation where the output is not electricity as we know today, but the output would be directly hydrogen that would be used for whatever application of hydrogen. So it, it's really to, to demonstrate that we are able to do this without putting the, the electricity or the power through public grids, but we can do it directly at the wind turbine. The, the Brande uh, hydrogen plant, that, that's really to, to kind of validate the concept and so on. The, the future is really to scale it up to, to commercial size wind farms, both maybe on, uh, on existing wind farms, but also for, for, for new build outs. So the future is really that we, we bring this into scale. The, the Bande plant can produce like 200 kilograms of hydrogen per day. It's, mm -hmm. it's nothing. Uh, we, we need to uh, produce millions of tons per year in order really to make a difference in the energy transition we are looking into. Safety is, of course, a, a big focus area for us. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen, it, it, I, I am quite comfortable that we can make safe solutions on this because hydro, hydrogen is being used in many, many applications already. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we, we, we need to get uh, a full understanding of what does it really take to have hundreds of decentralized hydrogen production facilities because that's not what is known in the world today. But the good thing about hydrogen, if it's if it just can get away, if you confine it, then you have the risk because then you create the, the concentration that can create an explosion. But uh, as long as we are outside and the hydrogen can escape, the risk of creating a, a concentration of hydrogen can actually explode is pretty low. So it's about making a smart design. What we can do is we can really integrate things and, and, and utilize, you could say, the flexibilities we have in terms of regulation and, and things on the turbine and the electrolyzer. So, so we have really the opportunity to optimize things so we, we get uh, say as cheap as possible hydrogen coming out of the combined integrated solution. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's where we can make a big difference because we somehow adapt the turbine to run in an optimal way together with the electrolyzer and hence create maximum output. Uh, you, you say everybody can do it to a certain extent. I think the, the, what, what is important, what we can do is we know the turbine, we know the controls, we know the capabilities of the turbine. Uh, anybody would not, of course, know that. So we know 
we can stress the components uh, further maybe when for this application we can uh, use uh, the turbine's ability to regulate to to optimize the, the operations mm -hmm. etc it's not easy to do for for somebody who has designed them to this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of be the forerunner of something that that really matters and i i personally see this as 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 you say being in the energy business as one of the biggest opportunity you will have in life of really making something that really will matter for the world. Mm -hmm. So so I think for me that is motivation number one. And then of course there is also you know being the being the one that kind of get the learnings first is also giving you an advantage to position yourself more strategically in mm -hmm. in this new kind of business we see. Our vision in terms of the hydrogen is is really to create a solution that will enable the renewable energy industry to step up to the second, we say, second wave of decarbonization. I think we have, as an industry, and I'm just not just talking wind, I'm also talking solar, it's been extremely successful on the first wave. And I think we now, as an industry, need to step up and say, okay, how do we then solve the next thing, which is really uh, removing the, the emissions from all the fossil fuels we have today. And it's a slightly more complicated one than the direct electrification we have done. So there is some challenges ahead from us, but I'm fully confident that we have the technology to generate the energy for this transition. We just need to get, we would say, the implementation right. So that is our main goal. Thank you very much, Paul Skjabek. We stay directly in Northern Europe and move to the Danish Wind Export Association. Corporate trainer Stefan D. Neumann will be showing us a video about offline oil filters in wind turbines, focusing also on the benefits of clean oil in the gearbox and pitch system, as well as online monitoring of oil and the conditions of equipment. Stefan, the stage is yours. Hi, I'm Stefan Neumann. I'm corporate trainer with CC Jensen and also Noria partner. So today I'm going to talk about oil filters on wind turbines. CC Jensen has more than 65 years of experience within different uh, segments and will work in industry, marine, mining, power and of course wind. The products are available in more than 40 countries, so you will also find a representative near you. We have CTC filters on more than 120,000 wind turbines worldwide uh, and we work with all the major OEMs, so Siemens Gamesa, Vestas, GE and you name them. CC Jensen is a CO2 neutral company. That means that we're not producing uh, excess of CO2 uh, and we're using sustainable uh, resources for our filters. So no chemicals, no plastic, no metals. So it's only the CTC filters that are as natural as the energy your wind turbines are producing. So when you use a CTC filter on the turbines, the benefits will be that you optimize the power output and the um, uh, increased profit, you will also reduce the uh, loss production factor, you will be prolonging the life of the component and the oil itself and uh, reduce any expensive uh, repair. So we work with gearbox filtration, we work with pitch and uh, the uh, main bearings if they are oil lubricated. So the gearbox is of course the heart of the wind turbine, there's huge forces involved here. Uh, the challenge is that when the oil film thickness is so thin and you have contamination in there, you will uh, have very expensive downtime and you may even risk uh, getting fines because you cannot produce electricity. Uh, also, the oil will uh, last shorter when it's contaminated, so you have to change the oil prematurely. The benefits of having a CTC filter on the wind turbine gearbox is that you have the filter with the largest dirt holding capacity. So it's designed for the normal service intervals. So it only needs to change the filter inserts on timely. And also re when reducing both particles, water and oxidation or varnish, it means the components will last longer and the oil itself. So you will be reducing the maintenance cost and the uh, reduce the amount of unplanned stops. Well, some turbines don't have a gearbox. Uh, if they're direct drive, but they also have oil in a pitch system. So the pitch is also very, very important. The challenge is again, if the oil is contaminated here and you have high pressure in the components, you will have 
may be the erratic or malfunction of the hydraulic components, the valves and so on, uh, and maybe even leakages from the hydraulic cylinders and very short oil life if the oil is contaminated. So by putting on a CGC filter, you're having uh, the varnish out, the particles, the water from the system, and that means that you will have a system that operates as it should do and longer component life and oil. So the filter we're using is, uh, for example, this one, the key filter. You can see the lid can pop up, so it's very simple to install uh, and uh, change filter inserts. Um, it's designed for air contaminated oils, so designed for, for wind. Uh, and of course, you will be removing both particles, water and varnish from the oil. If you want to monitor uh, the oil itself, we have different solutions. So you can either have the hardware sitting directly onto the filter like here, so a particle um, um, contamination unit here, so looking at particle counts and you have a moisture transmitter. Or you can use the CMU, that is a, a more advanced solution where you have again a particle counter, moisture transmitter. You can also have an oxidation or varnish trend sensor, wear debris sensor, uh, pressure in and out and uh, external sensors like the wind turbine on and off or load. So the software that, that works with the data, either you can use your own SCADA system, like for example for this one, uh, or you can use our cloud-based solution that requires an internet connection. So it could be cellular or Wi-Fi, not so typical on wind turbines, but more Modbus or CAN bus cable. So the data that uh, you get, you can either, like I said, analyze yourself, or you can let us do it with the Trender solution. This is for example, the Trender Basic. This is an uh, uh, online monitoring um, cloud-based solution where we have hard limits. So if you exceed a certain limit, for example, an ISO code 16, 14, 11, you get a warning. You can also get a more advanced solution where you're working with machine learning and our mathematical models that will adapt it to the individual system. That means that the warnings are coming if the trend deviates from the normal operation patterns. So for example, if the um, uh, cleanliness uh, increases, so you have more particle counts, but the load of the turbines is not. By the way, do you know the difference between a pleated inline type filter and a depth media? The depth media, the cellulose filters we are using here, have a very, very large surface area. The internal surface area of these uh, fibers is 120 square meters uh, per gram up to 150 square meters per gram. That means that an insert like this will have an uh, equal amount of surface area as 60 football fields. Now that is crazy, but it means that you will be distributing the oil in an optimal way for filtration of particles, water and varnish. The inline filters here are of course also important. Uh, they have lower pressure loss, but they have also a lower dirt hole capacity. I want to share a case with you. Um, we have different clients and one of our clients had some Nordix N90 wind turbines, uh, five of them, and they had big issues with the uh, contamination of the oil in the gearbox. So the um, oil was contaminated with particles and varnish uh, and they needed to change the oil. Now, instead of doing that, they installed this filter here, so a, a fine filter 27 series, um, and the oil cleanliness was taking from, if you look at four micron particles, going from uh, in the 20s down to 15, so an ISO 15, 13, 11. Now that means you are reducing the particle count by 97%. And again, you don't need to change the oil, so the, you could save 2,500 euros per wind turbine and again get longer life of the components. If you want to change the inserts uh, in the CTC filters in a faster, safer and uh, better way without any oil waste, you can use this filter insert change kit. Uh, now this is pumping the oil directly from the housing into this uh, container. Then you change inserts, and when you're done replacing the insert, you pump the oil back in, so you don't waste a drop of oil. So a very safe and easy way to do it. 
Thank you very much for your time. My name is Stefan Nyman and I will be conducting an online uh, webinar here in January where I will elaborate on these topics. So go visit cdc.dk and find more information or find a sales rep you can talk to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's always great to hear success stories in the end, like the Nordics one you just mentioned. That brings us to our next partners this afternoon. The company is named Dive, and they are providing innovative upgrade solutions for multiple types of turbines. They are industry's preferred retrofit partner, enabling their clients to unleash the full potential and control of their assets. It has an impact, for example, on the increase of annual energy production, the independency of the OEMs, and the chance of self-service and reduction of service costs. Let's see how this product is working. Hi, my name is Klaus Larsen. As Vice President for our large key account customers, it's my pleasure to introduce you to this video. If you invest just 10 minutes of your time, I will guarantee you an unmatched return of investment. Hi, my name is Jan Felber. I'm a business developer at Dive Wind Power. Um, in my job, I see a lot of different uh, levels of pain in the wind industry. Um, a lot of asset owners complain of constraints uh, due to rigid service agreements. My job is to find out how I can solve and ease their pains, uh, providing them with the best possible retrofit solution for the given turbine brand. Um, our goal is to make uh, turbines run better and extend their lifetime. As an asset owner, could you imagine a scenario where you could unleash the full potential of your turbine and increase your annual energy production, get access to all turbine data, have the possibility to be independent from OEMs and do your own service. If you can answer yes to just one of these questions, you should not miss this video. I was once contacted by a major player in the wind industry with big parks on different kind of turbines. They were sick and tired of legal uh, issues, lawsuits and downtime uh, on lack of service um, on their turbines. And they asked if it was possible for us to make a retrofit solution that would ease all those pains. My simple answer was yes, of course. And we will most likely give you an AEP increase at the end. So what do we offer for our clients? At Dive, we have a toolbox of different solutions. We help to optimize chances with controllers. We have tools to include renewables to hybrid projects. We work with batteries. We also help to run even marine ships with less fuel consumption. But at the wind parks, we have something really special. Our upgrade solutions let you produce more energy with already existing power plants. And we develop these upgrade solutions with a big team of engineers who have tremendous experience in many different OEM brands. And we bring the latest technologies like even cloud-based AI controllers to your turbines. When we run a six month validation period, generating either a weekly or a monthly report. We actually provide all turbine data to the customer in an easy uh, to read uh, format. It gives the customer an insight they're not used to having. And we can actually pinpoint different levels uh, of pains through these reports. There's a very big difference in a VRCC problem on a V47 or a pits related issue on a Suslon S88. In the way we monitor and do the reports and having meetings after a retrofit with our customers, give them a kind of 
security that the turbines are running uh, the way they should be. And this is also a result of uh, pinpointing how we do our AEP increases. So the whole report validation monitoring uh, period of a retrofit is as important for us as for the customers. Okay, now let's talk about how we are realizing our solution. Uh, of course, everything is starting all of the sudden with the installation. This is done by adding an add-on controller to the tower base and followed by a decent side acceptance test to ensure safe operation of the turbine. And all of this is taking, uh, depending a little bit on the turbine type, but in the range of six hours. Once this is done, we are having our open access for the turbine, which ensures full accessibility and independent operation already for the service team and the maintenance team. Additionally, we, the controller comes with an open access uh, for external interfaces like, for example, Modbus DCP or OPC. On top of that, we are having, of course, some dive tools provided, like the service manager tools for supervision, maintenance, and parameter configuration, but also our dive scatter tools for local and remote supervision. Yeah, this is more or less than the basis for seeing what more we can get out of the turbine and coming to the point of the ability and the performance improvement topics. So on the one hand, we have here to improve our ability with improved alarm handling and control procedures, but also the very big point of site-specific controls. This, or part of this, for example, also a yaw optimization, ensuring the turbine yaw misalignment, which is quite a known topic, um, is getting aligned fully. And of course, also the power curve optimizations. And here, let's have a shorter look here. We are seeing here is power curve pre drawed a standard power curve as by turbine designed and already a little bit an outlook to the future what is possible and if we're thinking here about here what is possible with a turbine we have a couple of options which we can bring into of course there is a start down here with an improved cut-in optimization by improved start stop control for example but especially here we have the possibility to shift the power curve by example making an optimized pitch scheduling or as mentioned, the your optimization, taking care of having a better energy output at the middle wind area. Coming more to the switchover point, we have here, of course, our stall detection options and a peak shaving. This will allow us an improved operation in the below rated area, but of course, as we know, we're having a quite a decent operation time also in a rated speed area, or rated power area of the wind turbine. And here we're having a well-known option to make a general rated power increase, a power improvement, but also taking into consideration site-specific controls and cutout extensions, allowing each turbine to operate longer than initially designed. How we this is done is, as mentioned already, with our engineers doing site-specific optimization of the turbine. And of course, all these needs a load validation and also a lifetime validation of your turbine. Of course, all of this is added or is handled also with a third party approval to ensure everything is within the design limits. This allows us to operate your turbine on a higher energy output per year, on a better availability and with open access for your service team. On top of this, we're having, of course, also our park level system, which means not only the term is affected, but also on park side, we're coming up with our park control solution, which is a central controller installed in a point of common coupling and allowing uh, active and reactive power control. This is especially needed for handling of grid operator demands, which are quite local, specific and locally, and of course, also upcoming grid code demands. This allows all in all an up-to-date operation and open access operation of your turbine. Hi, do you want to know how much you can get from investing in a dive controller? On our webpage, you can find a tool to estimate your business case and return on investment. Simply enter your turbine model and we bank data and you will see different outputs. For example, you could select a semi-wind turbine and then set 
the capacity factor of your wheel bar or the lifespan, as well as the current wind to bank age. Finally, set up a price for the megawatt hour and you will see your case. With this tool, you can very easily calculate your business case for different models like the Semyon, Festas, Enercom, or Suslo. Just set very simply enter your data and you will see what is the return of the investment. If you are interested in knowing more about our advanced control solutions for wind turbines, we would like to offer you an online session where we will discuss your project. Please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. Thank you so much, Alexander, and all the guys at DIFE. I think that was very helpful to know. That brings us to our next speaker this afternoon, coming from the Basque Energy Cluster in Spain. The Basque Sea Power Project aims to promote the collaborative research and development of technologies and solutions for offshore wind power structures, but as well for the new generation of high power wind turbines and their towers and auxiliary systems. Jorge Peña, project manager at the Mechanical Design and Product Integrity section, has more details. Thank you very much. I will put just one short presentation in order to have uh, some graphic information for you. Can you see my screen? Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thanks to the organization, camera directors, the attendees, the consortium partners, and the energy cluster of the Basque country. My name, as said, is Jorge Peña, the responsible of Senner Company, the leader of the consortium Sea Power. The purpose of this small talk is to introduce to an offshore wind project that, although modest in, in budget, is ambitious in scope and is being developed by a highly motivated group of companies for the Basque country in the north of Spain. As a context for the Sea Power, firstly, I would like to speak about the Basque country, more precisely about the involvement and capacities for innovation in the field of offshore wind. The Basque country is in a central location in relation to main city in Europe, covering a small area, but with one of the largest industrial concentration in Europe. Here you can see some figure. We feel particularly proud that the Basque country is the Spanish region with the highest intensity in R&D. The Basque country has developed powerful industrial fabrication in the wind sector based on the combined effect of global partners and global players leadership such as Iberdrola and Siemens Gamesa, but also with an innovative and competitive supply chain. The Basque country is the home of more than 100 companies, which complete in different levels within the energy value chain, with a clear focus on technology and innovation. Spain also is showing high capabilities in offshore wind. For example, from the 27 flooring solutions for offshore wind identified worldwide, seven correspond to a Spanish patent and four are in the Basque country. Also, there are two testing centers in Spain, including BMEP in the Basque Country. One of the floating solution developers, Nautilus, is actively involved in the Sea Power Consortium. And obviously, from the Basque Country facing the sea, Sea Power. Well, what is Sea Power? I catch my breath. Sea Power project aims to promote the collaborative research and development of technologies and solutions for offshore wind power foundations, towers, and auxiliary system for the new generation of high power wind turbines. For that purpose, nine bus companies, coordinated by Sener, join forces in the Sea Power project to cooperate and look for synergies in the development of new offshore solutions. The capabilities of these nine co companies cover the whole spectrum of skill to de design new innovative solutions. Sorry, but I need to name them all. Sener is the leader, it's an engineering company, also EPC company. IDOME is an engineering company. Nautilus is a floating foundation developer. 
the trail is an ethical connector, RK fastening solution, ISEA towers and monopiles, HASO lifting system, Mugape surface treatment, Navacel offshore winds extractors, and the research centers, Technalia and Technical. Well, when we start the project, our concerns about the market pool were increase in wind turbine size. For example, we have introduced this year, in March, the INRI wind turbine 50 megawatts numeric model and also the Roscoe control model associated for developing our designs. Also, the development of floating solution to access wind resources in deeper sites. The assurance of the behavior in has environment and re the reduction of capex and opex, as always, is cost. Well, how does ePower approach the deals? With the development and validation of numerical models for offshore wind turbine substructures, with the development uh, of digital twins based on numerical models, with the development of advanced design tools for the evaluation of substructures and auxiliary system, with innovative design of towers and bottom fix and flooring foundation for large wind turbines, and with new designs of auxiliary elements, lifting elements, bolted joints, and electrical equ equipment. And finally, with the development of anti-corrosive and biofouling resistant coatings. We have the part from the design basis to reach to the validation test and the validation of the industrial processes. Well, we have followed the typical engineering process for those applications with two work teams, fix and flooring, but with transversal deep cooperation. That is one of the aim of this project. Well, let's see some highlights of the current status of the projects. The large tower, ISEA has been working in the design basis, the fabrication, the installation and the logistic of the tower, the performance over the jacket and the floater, and the feasibility of using just two sections instead of using three sections. The transition piece. Navacel has been working at the design basis for the large wind turbine, the fabrication, installation of, and logistics, and the design, the basic design with two concepts, platform and big beam box concept. Well, the electric preconnector, DTREL, has been working at the estimation of dynamic cable features. At this point, please, if some dynamic cable developer is listening, we are really open to collaborating this. The design basis for BMAP site, the preconnector design, the numeric models and validation, the tensile test, and the electrical connection maneuvers. For the coatings for hard environment, Mugape has been working at corrosion, biofouling, and impact resistant coatings, the application process optimization, the coating layers reduction, and the coating layers things reduction. Well, for the floating foundation, Sener has been working at time dom domain numeric model, the frequency domain numeric model, the control numeric model, and the floating foundation basic design. The naval architecture, optimizing structure and performance, the real based design and rationally based design, and the dynamic cable structural design. Also for the foundation, Nautilus has been working at the advanced foundation design, departing for the current validated concept. Nautilus has the patent that we have uh, described before. Where has been Nautilus working in? Advanced numeric and mathematical models, station keeping system, tower and transition piece interface, station keeping system calculation models, and escalation models for even bigger platforms. And finally, and not less interesting, the bottom fix foundation. IDOM has been working on, at the innovative jacket design, numerical models and design tools, the modular fabrication, production nodes and welding, the digital twin based on numerical models, and the technical economical tool for optimizing the electrical evacuation of wind farms by programming complex algorithms. Summarizing, the work of Sea Power Consortium has been, and it's, 
numerical models for validation of designs, integrated and innovative solution for towers and transition pieces, fixed and floating wind power foundation, system for access and elevation, which can be integrated in the initial phases of the manufacture of large part, and coatings for the protection against impacts and biofouling. That's all. I would like to thank you for the attending and also thanks the best Basque government for the support in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jorge, uh, for this very, very interesting approach from, uh, from Basque country. Um, let me just uh, ask you a short question. When, you, when I have looked at, uh, at the card and the map, uh, and, and you've been showing uh, all the floating um, uh, uh, towers that you have uh, in front of the coast, how much gigawatt, how much megawatt is, is the perspective for Basque uh, country to, to produce from wind? I'm, 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 I'm sorry saying that uh, for the moment there isn't any uh, concrete project for the Basque country. Okay. We have, as mentioned, the, the testing center, but we don't have a, a, a project in the coast, a, a, a concrete project for the coast. Mm. There, is, there are projects, or well, intention of having projects in the Canary Island, and also in, in the Catalonia region. But concretely in the Basque country, for the moment, we expect we have the opportunity of being there. But for the moment, I'm sorry saying, but uh, there isn't any, uh, any, any project that we can put in a presentation, for example. Okay, I'm sorry. great to know, because uh, I've learned the other day that Portugal, for example, is um, doing some uh, networking, uh, for example, with the harbors of Rotterdam. So uh, it might be an interesting uh, approach to see uh, if one of the parts of uh, the Basque country could could kind of find uh, a neighbor a neighbor harbor in, in another European uh, country to deliver directly uh, the energy, so uh, might be interesting. So perhaps if you don't have the towers by now, uh, next year it might be completely different. So hopefully, uh, and all the best uh, luck to you. Uh, this uh, approach from wind energy uh, helps you to find the uh, uh, consisting corporate partners. Thank you very much. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure, Holge. Another super interesting topic uh, is on the list of our next speakers. Um, his company saves wind park farmers uh, a lot of money because his company is reliably detecting lightning events. As you might know, wind turbines are often affected by lightning strikes, especially the risk for upward lightning with an initial continuous current is very high and cause blade damage due to erosion. Christian Vögel is Global Account Manager of the Business Unit Energy of DNSE. He's got some more information for all you professionals out there. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me having today the opportunity to give you a short introduction of our lightning measurement system, DIN Detect. My name is Christian Vögel. I'm in charge of global account management power generation, especially for wind and photovoltaic. Before talking about our system, I want to give you a short introduction of the company DIN. DIN is the globally leading specialist in the field of lightning protection and provider of smart protective solutions. In this area, we have 110 years of experience. Globally, we have 22 subsidiaries and we are active in 70 countries. DIN has worldwide more than 1,900 employees. DIN offers solutions from a single source. In the field of external lightning protection, we offer air termination rods to protect the measurement equipment on top of the nacelle. In addition to that, we also can deliver surge protective devices to protect the electronic equipment inside of the turbine. We offer also material for earthing and equipotential bonding. And additionally, we offer a lot of services and support. In the right picture, for instance, you can see our test center. And in this test center, we can make lightning current tests up to 400 kA, for instance, on rotor blades. OK, let's talk now about our lightning measurement system, DIN Detect. I think it is well known that lightning damages on wind turbines is a big problem for wind turbine manufacturer as well as for the operator of wind turbines because their main goal is to achieve a high efficiency of the turbine. Especially the rotor blades are very often damaged by lightning. When you have such big damages, as you can see in this picture, it will cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to repair this damage. 
but you have to know that lightning normally not immediately causes such big damages. A lightning normally creates just a small damage, and these small damages very often stay undetected. That means the wind turbine will be further operated, and during this further operation, this damage is getting bigger and bigger. And this will cause high downtimes and high maintenance and repair costs. Lightning measurement systems can help to avoid these costs and to avoid these downtimes, but therefore they must be able to measure every lightning. That means they must be able to measure downward lightnings as well as upward lightnings. And especially upward lightnings have a high risk. That's why I want to give you more information on this type of lightning. In this picture, you can see a typical upward lightning. And as you can see, the upward lightning starts at an, at an high object on the Earth and the leaders going up towards the cloud. This will happen mostly on high objects like wind turbines or radio towers. Scientific researchers have shown that up to 90% of all flashes to wind turbines are such upward lightnings. But you have to know that due to their special characteristic, which we will see on the next slide, a lot of such upward lightnings will not be detected. That means a lightning location system is not able to detect this kind of lightning. So it is possible that you have um, lightning damage on your turbine, but the lightning location system says there was no lightning and this will lead to long discussions. This slide shows a typical profile of an upward lightning. An upward lightning always starts with an initial continuous current, the so-called ICC, as you can see here. This ICC is mostly superimposed with short peaks like this one and followed by return strokes like you can see here. Interesting to know is that the initial continuous current is very often below 1 kA. That means we are talking about a current of just a few hundred amps. But when we have a look on this area below 1 kA, we will see that the charge content in below this area is around 80% of the total event. That means if you have a lightning measurement system with a trigger level above 1 kA, it will not give you reliable information about uh, this lightning event because around 80% of the total charge content is missing. And even if you are talking about a lightning event with just a few hundred amps, the charge content can very often exceed 300 coulomb. And 300 coulomb is defined also for 200 kA lightning. That means the charge content for such a lightning event with just a few hundred amps has the same charge content like a 200 kA impulse current. Let's have a look what damages can be caused by this charge content. And to give you an idea, we did a test in our lab. This metal plate was affected with a current of 400 uh, amps and a charge content of total 208 coulomb. And as you can see, the charge creates a lot of holes. And all these holes were created by just one lightning event. This can happen because the lightning current will jump from one attachment point to the next. This means during one ICC event, during one initial continuous current event, it is possible that more damages will be created. And I think this shows that it is worth to measure this lightning as well. Good, let's now speak about our system. Our system, the Inditec, consists out of four individual components. The first one is the Rogowski coil. The Rogowski coil should be installed inside the nacelle, for instance, at the transition between hub and nacelle. The second component is the integrator and the integrator will always be delivered together with the coil. Then the third component is our data locker, and the data locker is the brain of our system. In the data locker, all data is being processed, and this device offers also uh, interfaces to make an implementation of our system into the IT structure of the wind turbine. The last component are our blade detection units. The blade detection units will be installed in the root of the blade, and this device gives you the information which blade was hit by the lightning. But the question now is, what requirements has to be fulfilled by a lightning measurement system to give a real advantage to the operator of a wind turbine? The first requirement is such a system need a large measuring range to be able to measure really every lightning, that means upward lightning as well as downward lightnings. The second requirement is it needs, it needs also a high accuracy. 
to give reliable information about the lightning event and the system must be easy to install also for retrofit because otherwise it will cause further downtime which should be avoided. Let's check what requirements we can fulfill with the Indetect. The Indetect has a wide measuring range from 60 amps up to 250 kilo amps. That means we can measure every lightning. And in addition to that, we offer also a very high accuracy, plus minus 5%. And this is unique in the market. And this will give you reliable information about the lightning parameters. And the Indetect can be also very easy installed. The installation is done in less than five hours, so the downtime is also very short. That means with the Indetect, an operator of a wind turbine can save money. But the question is how he can save money, because a lightning measurement system will not avoid any lightning to a wind turbine. Which benefits do an operator of a wind turbine have from a lightning measurement system? The first one, he can make an on-demand based blade inspection, and this will already save some money. With the Indetect, he will also get a reliable confirmation about the lightning event, for instance, for the insurance company. So that means there will be no discussion, was there a lightning or not. And with the Indetect, he is able to prevent subsequent damage. And so he can reduce downtimes as well as maintenance and repair costs. If you want to find out more information about the Indetect and to find out how much money can be saved with the system, visit our website den-international.com or you can also go directly in contact with me. Here you will find my, my contact details. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to give you a lot of information about our lightning measurement system, the Indetect. I wish you a great day. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Christian Fögerl. Great to have you here with us and your company. We're directly moving on to another very special solution for producing energy with the power of wind. Producing energy with kites. The company that is offering this solution is promising renewable energy technology with a large potential to play an important role in the future energy mix and, of course, to tackle climate change. Udo Zillmann, Secretary General of Airborne Wind Europe, will explain the technology behind, present important players and show how a collaboration with the established wind industry could provide benefits for everyone. Udo. Hello, I'm Udo Silman, Secretary General of Airborne Wind Europe and I would like to show you today Airborne Wind Energy or how to produce energy with kites. The concept I want to present you is called Airborne Wind Energy and since many of you may not know it, I would like to quickly discuss the principles and the concepts, tell you about the advantages and then also show you the current state of the Airborne Wind Energy industry and how you could maybe interact with us. So, how can you produce energy with kites? Well, you need the kite, as you can see on the left picture. You tether it to the ground and you add a winch on the ground where you want to tether around. And then the kite flies circles, fully autonomously, of course. And then you pull on the tether. The kite pulls on the tether with a strong force, unwinds the tether from the winch, and there you produce the electricity with the generator. Once the tether reaches its end, the kite flies quickly back. You reel in, and the cycle starts from new. This is how what they call ground gen technology, or the yo-yo, because of the movement. There's an alternative to this, which is called the FlyGen technology. There you have mini wind turbines on the kite that you can see in this picture, and you produce the electricity on the wing during the flight, and uh, you bring it down through the tether. If you look at the whole technology, what we do is we replace the uh, heavy and uh, massive parts of a wind turbine and replace this with smart software and controls algorithms. And we only have the outer tip of the wind turbine blade which produce the most electricity. The, this is the general principle. This is how the, the first systems will look like. Here you see our members and their prototypes. And this is how it work, looks like in practice. This is a 
a wind energy system producing electricity fully autonomously controlled. Here you see the wing and the tether if you look exactly. And this is the flying the patterns of eight where the wing is pulling the tether out. Uh, you can also see the, the drum, how it's unreeled and there the generator producing electricity. Um, and it's doing a few more turns of energy production and then uh, if you remember the tether has to be reeled in and this will happen with the next turn. And there it goes. Now it flies back. Uh, if you looked, the tether quickly stopped and then the, the winch uh, turned back and reels in. And that was it. Back to power generation. Uh, back to flying the figures of eight. Um, yes, it's a pretty dramatic movement. It would be impossible to control by a pilot, but the software and the actuators make it possible. So, why would we do this? And why should you maybe do it too? Well, uh, you see the one advantage here, and this is the capex. If you look at the right side of this chart, this is the most, uh, these are the parts that we do not need for air wind energy, which is the tower, the rotor hub, the blades, and the foundation. And that's 50% of the total capex, mostly material costs. These we can replace with uh, the software and a thin tether. This is the advantage of airborne wind energy, which saves 90% of the total materials. Here you see the saving of 90% um, on a visual, uh, with visuals, you see much lower footprint, much lower um, visual impact. The second advantage is we can fly higher with the wind, airborne wind energy system, higher than the 100 meter hub height that you have with a wind turbine, and up to 500 meters high. You see the wind resource is much better on the left side. It is the 100 meter above ground, the standard wind turbine height. And on the right side, you have the 500 meter hub height wind. Also, we are flexible with the altitude. So we can uh, fly also at 200 meters if at a certain point of time, there's better wind than at 500. And this also shows in the graph on the right. So much better wind resource for airborne wind energy. Uh, second, if you add this and uh, have also a light system that can produce with low wind, you will come to much higher, uh, much more full load hours, much higher capacity factor that you can see here. So basically, the big question, how can we feed in to the grid much renewable fluctuating power becomes much less of, less of a problem if you have uh, air wind energy systems. So uh, let's uh, sum up the advantages. In addition to the ones I mentioned, you have a much lower LCE and you are uh, flexible and you can reach new markets where you have to be small or flexible or mobile and that you don't have with uh, turbines. So where, are, where do we stand? Uh, can you already buy an air wind energy system? Not yet, um, but we have come a long way from the last 10 years. Here you see some of the milestones uh, that we crossed as an industry um, since we started roughly 10 years ago when first people thought, well, uh, the digital technology, the sensors, the drone technology is far enough that we can even think about doing something like airborne wind energy. And we are now at the demonstration phase that you can see here. And the next phase will be the commercial viability. So what we do now is we have working prototypes. Now they have to be deployed on the first test sites and uh, then uh, scaled up further to make bigger devices. And well, this will be quite costly um, and we won't be com fully competitive yet. So there will be some need for public funding, but it's worth it, I think. Uh, if you look at this chart from uh, E.ON, now RWE, um, they agree with us that on the long run, we have the potential to have a much lower LCE than uh, wind turbines. Of course, for the first time, for the first systems, we will not be competitive. That's why we need niche markets to start with. 
And here you can see some examples of niche markets that could be interesting entry markets for this new technology, where we do not compete with wind turbines. This is one of the niche markets. It's uh, propelling ships. So you can't put a wind turbine on a ship, but you can put a kite on a ship and propel it. If you look at floating wind, a big advantage is, of course, we are lighter. We don't have any bending moments, so much simpler to have a floater built for an airborne wind energy system than for a wind turbine. Repowering offshore sites is an interesting aspect. And this is how the global industry looks like. Also academia, we have other players interested or working on airborne wind. You can see them on this map, but uh, mostly it's within Europe. And also within Europe is the Mega Ore Interreg program uh, from Northwest Europe, Interreg. So this is a program where um, airborne wind energy companies work together with regions and other players like utilities to build the first demonstration parks and to roll out the technology. So in a very interesting program and the, this is still looking for additional participants. So if you're interested in this technology, you can contact us and work with the Northwest Europe Interreg Mega All project. Also, out of this project, we will need a lot of uh, collaboration with other sectors uh, until we become a mainstream technology and uh, can produce uh, gigawatts of airborne wind energy systems and deploy them. So um, you're invited to communicate with us, to discuss with us how you could work together in building this airborne wind energy future for us. I would like to thank you for your attention uh, and if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact us. Um, we are happy to help you interact with us and our members. Thank you very much. That was really impressive, I must say. Thank you very much indeed, Udo Zimmer. Our last Speaker's Corner member in our Exhibitor's Corner is a company from China. They are specialized in the field of logistics and how to handle heavy parts. As the company's name already promises, Hangfa Robotics is counting on the help of artificial intelligence and mechanical powers. Hangfa will show you some examples how to handle heavy parts in a plant stably and safely with the power of robotics. Hangfa Company is dedicated to researching, manufacturing and selling mechanism wheels, omni wheels, standard robots, heavy duty transporter and AGV. Hangfa Company is located in Shichuan, Chengdu with production facility, research center, and sales office. The first factory was built and put into use in 2006. The second factory was built and put into use in 2010. Most of researchers are young and works on research, development, and innovation of handling equipment. According to the belief of high reliability, they research, develop, and design automated, accuracy, and functional products for the whole world. After finishing design, our engineer will do finite elements analysis to make sure the strength of frame the frame of the transporter can be placed on the large gantry machining center. After the frame made, 
vibration agent and inspection with magnetic particle. Frame will be assembled with our parts. Until now, Hanfa Company has four series heavy duty transporter Omni Titan, Omni Turtle, Omni Rhino, and new series Omni Ant. Omni Titan The Omni Titan series can provide a load capacity of 0 to 500 tons for one vehicle, making them ideal for transporting large size and large tonnage workpieces such as wind turbine, wind blade, wind hub, transformer, and so on. because it has the function of self-lifting of the whole vehicle, in addition to being used to directly carry the workpiece, it can also indirectly carry the workpiece after self-supporting by drilling into the tooling frame and lifting the tooling frame. Multiple omni tie trucks can be synchronized to support every large component depending on user requirements. The Omni tie-in transporters can be remotely controlled and can also be used as a fully automated AGV transport system. It can run on asphalt, self-leveling, concrete, steel, and hard soil ground, and has a strong adaptability to ground conditions. Omni Turtle Single Omni Turtle mobile platform can load 1 to 100 tons, and it could make a local translation, rotation, local translation, and rotation simultaneously. This platform is often used in fields such as a bulk machine or parts transferring, train, and aircraft assembly, material transportation, etc. With its omnidirectional moving ability, Omni Turtle can carry the bug to joint and assembly in high precision, simplifying the process, enhancing the operability, reducing the operating risk, and improving the efficiency. For the parts or machines that are not easy to be handled by cranes, or that need to transfer within different workshops, Omni Turtle is an economical solution. Omni Rhino Omni Rhino series with polyurethane wheels and Omni wheels system provides 1 to 120 ton payload. Similar as Omni Titan and Omni Turtle, Omni Rhino enables translation, rotation, and steering movement in any direction within the plane. Different with Omni Titan and Omni Ant, Omni Rhino has special suspension system, air spring suspension, which can provide best stability and safety. Because of that, Omni Rhino is generally used 
insane transforming system and special situation. This series brings more solution for different projects. Omni and Omni and series provides zero to thirty ton payload and provides a high speed and efficiency solution in light transforming. Although Omni and is not more flexible than Omni Turtle. Omni Ant series has smaller dimension, light payload, and high speed. That means Omni Ant can run in smaller and special environments and in those kind of functional situation. It will be more useful. Our four series transporters are designed for different situations and until now, they have covered most of usage situation. Contact us to know more. Thank you so much for these insights into the near future of robotics. This wraps up our Speaker's Corner for today. We're back in a second after this short commercial break.